Oh, it's a blessing, a wonderful blessing. The service is a wonderful song. If you have your Bibles open to the book of Esther in chapter number 6 this morning. Esther in the 6th chapter. So we look at some more truths from God's Word. I'm so thankful that we have uh, God's Word for us, that we can read it and heed it. And I'm so thankful that we live in a place that we can do that. All right? And no matter where you're at today, I'm glad for uh, the ability to meet here in church. Thanks for all those who join us online as well and to look at God's Word and to see some truth from God's Word this morning. We look at, we've been looking at the story of Esther and how Esther chose to believe God and how we ought to believe God. That is our theme in 2019 for First Baptist Church. Really, this theme should not just stop this year. It ought to continue for the rest of our lives to choose to believe God. It seems that the Lord knew what He was doing when He led us toward this theme because who knew what... Did I say 2019? We're in 2020 now. Wow. I want to go back to 2019. Tell you what. But who knew what 2020 would hold when the new year and the ball dropped in New York City, right? If we had known that, maybe we just would have skipped 2020. Um, but you know that God is still good? Did you know that? Did you know that God still loves you? Did you know that? Did you know that God is still doing things in your life, in my lives, the lives of this country, or in the place of this country, in this city, in this town? God is still at work. You say, well, pastor, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes I don't see it. We like, as a family, occasionally to do puzzles. We've done one about every Christmas now, the last few years, and when we're up north on vacation, my wife and the kids put a, a puzzle together of, was it the rocks of Michigan? And so it was just a big picture of rocks after rock, you know, rocks and rocks, okay. We like doing puzzles. Now, you may hate puzzles, you may think we're weird, but that's, if you think we're weird, that's not the only reason you, you think we're weird, all right? We're weird for a lot of reasons. But we like puzzles, and, and we like to work on them, and we always work on the outside coming in. But I don't know about you, if, you, if you've ever done a puzzle, or at least maybe you can identify a puzzle two out of three times, that's enough. But we keep the box right here. And we look at the box, and then try to find the pieces that match the big picture. The big picture. You know that God is doing something bigger than we can see? He's doing the big picture. You know that, that God will not forsake His children? That's the big picture, is it not? Do You know that God orchestrates all things after the counsel of His own will. That's the big picture. God will not leave us or forsake us. That's the big picture. But along the way, we can lose sight of the big picture. Along the way, and, and you're doing a real puzzle, you find this little piece. And you're like, this doesn't fit. It doesn't fit because I don't see where to make it fit. I have tried it everywhere in this puzzle. You ever done that before? Or maybe you're like us, we do the outside edges first. And it seems like every puzzle we've ever had forgets one or two outside edges. Because you get them almost all the way done and you can't find this last outside edge. For sure, we wouldn't miss it. The people who put this together forgot the piece. No doubt about it. Instantly accusing the company of fraud. Yet a few minutes later, a few days later, a few years later, <laughs> you come down and there's one piece that you didn't think fit anywhere else. And lo and behold, you put it there, boom, it all comes together. You say, well, pastor, thanks for talking about puzzles in church today. What does that mean? Well, let's come back to the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, though the name of God is not mentioned, the hand of God is all over the book of Esther. And right now, we're at a point in Esther where there are some puzzle pieces, if I may, that don't seem to fit. I'll tell you now where I'm going. Sometimes in your life and my life, there are puzzle pieces that don't seem to fit. God, I don't know why you're doing this, because no matter how I turn this piece around, it doesn't work anywhere in the big picture that I, that I know that you told me is true. So this little piece you brought into my life, this situation, this person, this particular trial, I, I just, Lord, I can't see how this little puzzle piece fits 
in the big picture. And in Esther, chapter number 6, God begins to take some puzzle pieces and begins to move them around. God begins to unravel some situations to show how the puzzle pieces really fit. He begins to show the frailty of our own devices. Can I say this this morning, my friend? Whether you're able right now to see the whole picture or whether you have just one little puzzle piece, would you continue to trust God? Would you continue in your heart and in your life to say, you know what, I choose to believe God. No matter what this piece may look like today, no matter what it may look like tomorrow, I trust God for the big picture. This morning I'll look at how God in Esther chapter 6 began to unravel some situations. In three ways began to show some frailty of devices of humanity that I believe at times we can be guilty of as well. We find strength in some of the things that we do. Men, we can find strength in our problem-solving abilities or our strength, our stamina, or, or our gumption. And if there's a problem, then we can solve it. Maybe just a little more overtime or a little more strength or I'll twist it one more way. We can solve it. In Esther 6, as God unravels this, we see the frailty, the foolishness of our devices. I've been here around church 18 and a half years now. Wonderful church. Wonderful people here at First Baptist Church. Can I get an amen? amen? Yet Christians, are we not guilty of trusting our own devices sometimes? When we ought to know better? When we ought to know with the big picture of God's truth? And that's our chapter 6, if you would begin, and we look at the first three verses, we're going to see how God began to unravel some of these things. On that night, Esther 6, verse 1, could not the king sleep? And he commanded to bring the book of records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bekphana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king of Hazarius. The king said, what honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have, these few moments. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be in tune to your word. There are needs, there are problems, there are situations this morning that only you can solve. Lord, I don't begin to profess to know all of the needs, but I know that you know them. I pray that your spirit would have freedom in this room, that we would be good soil. Those who have joined us online, that their hearts would also be touched by your word and your spirit would work. Lord, may we cast aside those ways that we trust our own devices and may we look to you. And Lord, may we again choose to believe you and to follow you. In Jesus' name I ask this morning. Amen. You could say, church, Pastor, we have this theme, I believe, God. It's all over the place. You've preached on it through Daniel. You've preached on it through Paul. And, you, and you're now through Esther. And then another character when you're done with Esther. You know what, Pastor? We get it. All right? We got it. We, we believe God. Yet does it not seem sometimes, Christian, that whatever situation we're in, God tends to bring us back to a point of faith in Him? Or is it just me for my life? That just when, when I believe, all right, God, I, I think we've got this, that God brings another situation, another storm, another test, another trial, whatever it may be, that God brings it back so that once again I am forced to walk by faith and not by sight. Does it not seem, though, Christian and my friend, and maybe it's just me, that, that you're, maybe you're guilty of, of what I am sometimes, where as quickly as I learn that I turn back to my own devices and I somehow think that I can do something, that I can accomplish something, that I'm smart enough. And all of you know, especially my wife, that I'm not that smart. I can't do anything. And here we have some frailty. I see, first of all, in this passage, if you would look, that on that night, the Bible says, could not the king sleep? 
I believe this is significant, and we see the frailty of our peace. If there's anything that we love, it is our sleep. Some of you love to have it at church. And I don't get after you for that. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I've slept through many a sermon before. So if you sleep through mine, that's okay. I will not do, I will not do what one teacher that I was aware of did. And she made the, the proclamation, well, if I put you to sleep, I will wake you up. And when a 10th grade student fell asleep, of which class I was in, she kissed him on the forehead and woke him up. I will not do that. I will not do that. But if one of you may be sleeping and I crack a smile, my mind may have wandered there for a moment to see what your reaction would be. But do we not enjoy our sleep? Do we not almost all of us universally shun the alarm clock? All right, I remember I had a friend in college, and he was a, a good young man. He, he had, a, um, he had a, a, a little Asperger's, so he was really dedicated to certain things a certain way. And he had this fire alarm alarm clock, all right, as loud as a firehouse station, it seemed. He was in the room of one of my good friends. And it was a, a point of contention in the room. It was so loud and so obnoxious and, show, and so frightening that uh, it would just shock my friend, my good friend, uh, into like almost oblivion every time this alarm went off. So he went to this young man named Michael and he said, Michael, he said, um, unfortunately they've, they've made a rule and you can't have this alarm clock. This young other young man didn't realize he was being uh, fooled with and he said, okay. And he went to Walmart, bought another one that was exactly the same. He just didn't have that alarm clock. He now had this alarm clock. Do we not shun alarm clocks, whether it be a phone? And sometimes some of you may, may have a problem getting up and you set five and six and twelve alarms all around the room, right? But, but all of us enjoy our sleep. In fact, if you don't get sleep, you look for ways to have sleep. And you either at church or you try it while you drive down the road. Neither being very beneficial to others in life. Our sleep. Have you ever been awake at night, not been able to sleep, tossing and turning? Are you ever glad about those moments? Do you ever say, wow, what a wonderful feeling as I tossed in my bed? Maybe, but most people I know are like myself. All of a sudden, my mind starts to race about the problems tomorrow that now I'm going to have because I can't fall asleep. Maybe you've been nervous about getting up early and so you keep on waking up all night long. What I'm trying to say is we value our peace and our sleep, do we not? We, we look forward to it. We rest. We rejuvenate. We, we sleep to escape ourselves. We sleep so we can conquer the next day. My wife, and this has been a point of contention in our home, she is not happy how quickly I can fall asleep. It takes me, uh, she says, under a minute usually. Under a minute. She then goes on to say, you know, the only reason you all fall asleep, I think she wags her finger like this, not really, she doesn't. She goes, you must be sleep deprived. I don't know why I fall asleep so quickly. My son James is the same way. I lay my head down on my, picture, on my pillow, boom, I can be out. My wife can be talking. And then she can wake me up. And I don't like to be woken up after I just fall asleep. She's like, how can I wake you up? You were just talking to me. Honey, you know, 59, 58, when, when it hits zero, I'm gone. But understand something. King Ahasuerus laid down to sleep like he had countless nights before. End of the day, he had a big day tomorrow. I'm ready to rule and, and get this kingdom. He was a, the monarch over all, all right? He was the leading ruler in the world. Persia had conquered the world and he lays down with all his authority and all his power he could not command sleep and God used the restlessness to accomplish his purpose King Ahasuerus was not as far as we know ever a man who turned toward God he was a man who rejected God worshipped false gods but he was not outside the authority of the true God. And, and though he thought he was in charge of a whole bunch, he was shown very quickly that even his sleep 
Even the rest that he thought and took for granted was subject to the king of heaven. You see, God is showing the frailty. The greatest king in Persia couldn't even sleep. You can command thousands and hundreds of thousands of soldiers, but you can't even command sleep. You can rebuild an engine, conquer the stock market, but you can't force yourself to fall asleep. Uh, some will count sheep. How's that work out for you? Some try to take other things to fall asleep. The fact is, we often try to bring some peace into our life when there is no peace to be found, and some will, will bring it uh, through more things. And if I get a multiplicity of things, then I'll have more of this peace in my life. And we know quickly that God shows a frailty of that, some by an external source, whether it be through a, a substance or through a beverage. But we know those things wear off and are worse for the wear. Some try to escape by enjoyment and pleasure. But we find out after a while those things are just empty. God re reveals the frailty of our own devices. And God was setting up this puzzle through lack of sleep. You think you're powerful, just wait till you can't even sleep. Not only is there the frailty of peace in this passage, but I see the frailty of plans. Don't forget that in this book there are some major characters. There's King Ahasuerus, he's the ruler. There's Esther, she's the queen. There's Mordecai, he's the uncle. And then there's Haman. Haman is the villain. Haman is the bad guy. When we ended up with chapter number 5, we had just left the banquet. That was last week. If you missed it, go back and watch it. It's on YouTube. And Haman and King Ahasuerus and Esther are at the banquet. Did I mention that Haman was there with the king and the queen? Did I mention that? He was thinking he was pretty hot stuff. On the way home, he passed Mordecai in the gate, and Mordecai did not bow down. Kind of the whole premise for the problem. And he went home and he gathered, if you remember, he gathered his closest advisors, his wise counselors, and his wife. And he began to tell them about all the riches that he had and all the children that he had. He said, but there's one thing that just throws me off, and it's this guy, Mordecai. And he had gallows built that night. And so it's this same evening. King Ahasuerus cannot sleep. And Haman is also not sleeping. And he had a plan. And he thought it was a good plan. His plan after the gallows were now built was to go to the king and to ask the king if he could go hang Mordecai right then. Look with me, we would, in verse number four and following. The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Now let me just pause there real quick. There is a, a part of the, of the account here that I can't quite wrap my mind around. I know that when I'm asleep and my wife is talking, wakes me back up, I'm not happy. Maybe some of you like to be woken up, but maybe you're like me and don't like to be woken up before you're ready to wake up. Why would you go to the one king who, if he doesn't extend the golden scepter, you're, you're killed, right? Why would you go wake him up in the middle of the night? Can, can, can you see what I'm saying here? Why would you risk this at first? Haman's not thinking clearly. All right, if you can't even get in when he's in a good mood with the golden scepter, you're going to wake him. Haman doesn't know he's not asleep. Haman doesn't know this. Why would you think this will be a good plan? I'm going to go wake up the king. Except Haman was full of himself. Haman knew that he was pretty good stuff. Did I mention he was at a banquet with just the king and the queen? Did I mention that? Haman thought, boy, this, this is great. So Haman has these plans. That's what the Bible says. Um, Haman came to speak into the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. I'm going to go there right now. I'm not going to wait till tomorrow. These are my plans. You know what? I'm done with Mordecai. My life will be complete once I get rid of this guy. We're still going to destroy all the Jews. But tonight, I'm going to get rid of this art enemy that I have who will not bow down to me in, in, the, in the gate. I'm getting rid of him tonight. And not a moment will pass. And I'm going to go wake up the king and tell him, ask him what to do. 
Verse number five, And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart. This is how I know that Haman was stuck on himself. Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? Do you see that? I, I'm not making up that Haman was stuck on himself. That's what the scripture teaches us right there, right? Haman says, Who else would the king want to honor than me? <laughs> well, Haman, there is someone else the king wants to honor, just so you know. And his name's Mordecai. Came and answered the king, verse 7, For the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. Can you see what Haman has now asked for, thinking it's for himself? I want the clothes that you no longer wear. There is some customs they would say in those cultures, it's a custom in that culture, that sometimes the, the rulers would never wear the same thing twice. That possibly could be true with King Ahasuerus. That every day was a brand new outfit. Men, don't complain about your wife's clothes. So he said, bring the clothes that you used to wear, the king's finest royal clothes. Bring those and bring your special clothes horse. Not just a, a, a kingly horse, but the horse that the king rode on and the crown. Bring that crown and put it on my head. Now, I don't know about you when you read the Bible, but when I read it, sometimes I put myself there and I can just almost see Haman bubbling with joy about what he's getting for himself, about his plans, right? He, he, he's so, I mean, can you not see, he's so full of himself. As he's talking, he's believing all this is to be done for him, and he's about to become unglued. I mean, it's better than any theme park, better than any, any event, even better than McDonald's. He's that excited. <laughs> Verse number 10. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste. And take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai. Let me talk to you next, not only the frailty of our peace, but the frailty of our plans. You see, Haman's plan was to destroy Mordecai, to hang Mordecai. The king's plan was to honor Mordecai. The king was there and he had, he had heard that, that Mordecai had stopped a plot and never been rewarded. Haman was there because Mordecai had offended him and he was to be destroyed. Coincidence or design? What are the odds that two men, two men in the same city, both high in authority, would be worried about the same man? Both driven to action by the same man. King Ahasuerus driven to action. Driven to passionate action because I cannot let this go on. That this man saved my life and was never rewarded. And Haman, on the other side, I cannot let this go on. He offended me. I'm going to destroy him. Coincidence or design? When the pieces of the puzzle don't quite make sense. King Ahasuerus can't sleep, and God says, I'm going to use that to direct your mind toward Mordecai. Haman can't sleep because he's so irritated and frustrated and upset, and God used that. The same man, they were both focused on the same man. Their thoughts were excited on the same man, and Haman's passion, and King Ahasuerus' passion, both for the same individual. You see, God used the same person to bring about an entirely different result. That's how our God works, isn't it? We look at it, and we just see this little piece of the puzzle. God says, in essence, you have no idea what I'm doing. You can't even see Haman past the end of your nose. You have no idea. And let Haman, if I can, dig 
his own grave. Mordecai's honor was a gift from his enemy. I don't know what King Ahasuerus would have thought. Apparently, he was stuck. Apparently, this is a problem. He couldn't quite figure out how to make it work. What can I do? And, and, whoa, Haman's here. Oh, my number two, he'll help me. He'll help me solve this problem. And he did. The frailty of our plans. We have tremendous plans sometimes, don't we? Great plans, plans that will work, plans that will succeed. Make sure they're God's plans. There was a builder of the first Eddie Stone Lighthouse in the English Channel. Apparently, as the story goes, he was so enamored with his own designs and workmanship that he made this statement, I wish for nothing better than to be building my lighthouse in a storm. And so he did. And neither him nor the lighthouse that he was trying to build has ever been heard of since. The frailty of our plans. But I see something else in this passage as well. The frailty of our peace, the frailty of our plans, the frailty of our position. Haman, which we read about, it was in second in command, and he was, he was the one who, who was the king's trusted advisor. Did I mention he was at a banquet with the king and the queen? Did I mention that? You would have thought that that would have done something, but God is bigger than our positions. Haman was an advisor, and King Ahasuerus asked for his counsel. Haman shouldn't have been leading anyone through the city. He was second in command, except now he's leading his enemy, Mordecai, through the city. Through, through the city. See, sometimes we put too much confidence in what we are, rather than who we are. We put too much confidence in what we are. Well, I'm a man. I can figure it out. I'm not lost. I'm taking the long route. I can solve this rather than who we are, a child of God. It's a big deal because of who God is. I'm joint heirs with Jesus, a big deal because of who God is. Haman imagined his life working because he was important. The reason he went there... Because he knew that the king would grant him his request. He knew that. I'm important. i got a good position. Yet he was dead wrong. God shows the frailty of our position. Each of these frailties, peace and plans and position, ought to point us back to God. When God strips away our frailty, we ought to be pointed back to him. In fact, when we see the frailty of our peace, it reveals to us the author of peace. In Mark, it says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. In Corinthians, Paul says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. You know what? When I see the frailty of my peace, I ought to be pushed back, driven back to the author of peace. In your life, if you have a lack of peace, run back to the one who brings peace to life. And I don't care how big the storm is, God can calm the storm. Frailty of peace brings us back to the author of peace. But sometimes we take those puzzle pieces. And rather than ask him where it goes, we keep on trying. You do that? Frailty of peace brings us back to the author of peace. The frailty of plans revealed to us the master planner. When your plans don't work out, don't forget Proverbs 16, verse 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Make sure, my friend, my my friend who's a Christian, make sure that God is directing your steps. Oh, not just the big picture, but the little steps. Where you ought to go, what you ought to do, how you ought to answer. Proverbs 19, verse 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord... That shall stand. You know what shall endure? The counsel of the Lord. You can make your own plans, but be careful when you make your own plans. It's like Jesus says, you've now built your foundation on sand. Make sure you build your foundation on rock, and that comes from Jesus Christ. The frailty of our position revealed to us the perfect promoter. Psalm 75 says, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. But I want to show you one more thing in this passage. 
One more thing that I almost missed. You see, we should know. We should know that God's in the big picture. But you know, sometimes we miss it. I did something devious today. I'm going to confess it right now. It's terrible. When I tell you this, I'm going to be sleeping outside tonight. All right? So just you pray for me. My wife's not going to be happy. But this morning, before I came to church, I knew what I was going to preach on, of course. And I opened up a brand new puzzle box at home. And I stole three pieces out of the puzzle box. <laughs> My wife just found out. She won't remember come Christmas when we do this is a Christmas puzzle. Come Christmas time, Brother Treadway, she's going to wonder where these three pieces are. And then she's going to remember. I'll be outside again. <laughs> it's devious, isn't it? Sometimes we feel like the devil has stolen our pieces. Don't we? He's taken the pieces of our life and just made a wreck of them. But we ought to know better. Can I show you something how, how God always reveals his truth? Would you look at one more thing in this passage that just caught my attention about how God always reveals himself. After this, Haman takes Mordecai and he takes him around the city and, and Haman is just a mess when this is done, as you can imagine. He goes back home in verse number 12 and Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house, mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. These same counselors, this, his same wife, who have counseled Haman all the way along, who have helped him devise and plan out in these devious plans, they knew better. They make this statement, if Mordecai is of the seed of the Jew. Now, how could this even be a question? It's not a question. In chapter number 3, Mordecai says this, I'm a Jew. All right? In the next verse, the servants tell Haman that Mordecai is a Jew. Later on, hey, um, Haman goes after the Jews because of Mordecai being a Jew. And in chapter 6, the chapter we're in, in verse number 10, I didn't read the verse, the king says to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse, and thou hast said, and do so even to Mordecai, the Jew. Even King Ahasuerus knew that Mordecai was a Jew. And the counselors and his wife say, well, if he is a Jew. No, no, there's no question he is. You see that? They completely missed it. Then they say this, if he is, Haman, you're in trouble. If he is, if he is, you're sunk. You ever wonder how they knew that? You ever wonder how they knew what would happen? God had revealed himself already. God had already showed himself. Don't miss that we are without excuse. Someone said this, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. You see, what happens is we know the truth. We know that God is in the bigger picture. But if we're not careful, we will miss it just like these people did. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson were in a tent one night. After sharing a good meal, they looked up at the night at 3 a.m. Sherlock Holmes nudged Dr. Watson and asked, Watson, look up into the sky and tell me, what do you see? Dr. Watson said, I see millions of stars. Sherlock Holmes says, and what does that tell you? Watson replied, well, astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Theolog theologically, it tells me that God is great and we are small and insignificant. It also tells me it's about 3 a.m. in the morning. And meteorologically, it tells me that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Sherlock? Sherlock said, it tells me someone stole our tent. Sometimes in our life, we feel like the devil's taking our pieces. We just see this. And we miss what God is doing right here with the big picture. God can take all of these pieces and orchestrate them in such a magnificent and masterful way that this ends up out of this. 
Don't miss the big picture. Don't miss trusting God during the time that you only see one piece. Maybe you're here today and all you see is one piece. And no matter how you turn this piece, it doesn't seem to fit. In fact, I can't even sleep at night. And God says, exactly. And that's exactly where that piece goes. Friend, you trust in God? Even when it doesn't make sense? I want you to choose today to believe God. Trust Him with all the pieces. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truths from your word. And Lord, this passage, you show the frailty of our devices. Lord, we can trust you or that you're doing something at times that we can't even see. I wonder this morning if you're here and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? It seems like there's a piece that doesn't fit. Would you pray for me that I would continue or would you help me to trust God? I want to make that choice again. I believe God. There's a piece that maybe doesn't fit that I turn it 35 different ways and maybe even seems like Satan's taking the piece. Say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? God spoke to me. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand up? Amen. 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 Would you pray for me? There's a peace there. Something's going on. I, I needed that. Would you pray for me? Who else? Amen. Amen. I wonder if you're here this morning. I wonder if you die today, if you are sure that you'd go to heaven. We'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. In just a moment, in fact, we'll stand for invitation. If you're not sure you're going to go to heaven, would you do me a favor? Would you slip to the front? We'll have someone open a Bible. A man if you're a man, a lady if you're a lady. And we can today show you how if you trust Jesus Christ, you can have a home in heaven today. I would say, Pastor, would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. I'll draw no more attention to you than to anyone else. But I would say, that's me, Pastor. Would you pray for me when you pray for others? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me? Maybe you've joined us online. Maybe that's you. You're not sure you're on your way to heaven. Would you call us? There'll be a number on your screen. We have folks right now by the phone. We'd love to open the Bible over the phone and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Lord, bless this time of invitation. Those who raise their hand, Lord, would they, even though they can't see maybe the full picture right now, the little pieces don't make sense, would we continue to trust you, Lord? Thank you for your goodness and for your master plan and direction. Lord, bless the invitation. Lord, those who don't know you as your Savior, when they trust you today, would you touch their hearts in Jesus' name? Piano's already playing. Let's stand to our feet. If God touched your heart, would you do business with God? Would say, that's me, Pastor. I, I, you come forward now. The altar's open.